Hello everyone! It's the end of 2024, which means it's time for the annual Ace Rolla shareholder meeting, where I discuss what we achieved this year, the plans for 2025, and what you can potentially look forward to on the channel. If you don't know who I am, go watch a different video. Now for the big announcement, I'm ditching Unity and moving to Godot. Twenty twenty four was my first year spent as a full time YouTuber, a position I will always be eternally grateful for. I spent January conceptualizing the details and rules of the first Ace Rolla Jam, which was a massive success. I predicted a hundred games submitted, and we ten x that for nearly one thousand games in total, cementing the event in itch.io history. Wow! A new type of video was also debuted in January, analyzing a frame capture of a game to give more insight into some of the rendering tech behind popular games. We first did this with Lethal Company and it was a huge success as it is currently my most popular video to date. In February, I had to move, so I put out another render review of the remake of my favorite game, Persona 3 Reload, in tandem with the start of the game jam. In March, I was really itching to create something new, so I decided to secretly enter my own game jam to prototype some tech for a future series. I ended up making Philocalia, a solitary confinement simulator that is fully ray traced while also using the system date and time to calculate the position of the sun in the sky. This project was meant to demonstrate that ray tracing alone isn't as complicated or as cool as one might think, and that it's actually path tracing that gives all those fancy visuals in modern games. Unfortunately, people didn't understand this very well, and instead just assumed I'm bad at my job or was clickbaiting them. The goal is to inevitably expand it into a full path tracer, as well as extend the sun position calculation to also include the moon so we can simulate stuff like solar and lunar eclipses. How exciting! In May, I finally released a comprehensive guide to physically based rendering, deriving Disney's BRDF from first principles and early lighting models like Blin Fong, trying to communicate how the road to interesting stylized rendering is through PBR, not around, and that the two are not mutually exclusive. In June, I got my glasses, had four teeth pulled, and braces put on, so I made an ASCII shader I had been thinking about for several years while I was high on painkillers. In July, I began working on my iterated function system particles but during that time, I was contacted by NVIDIA who wanted to fly me out for SIGGRAPH, the big industry graphics programming event, as well as offering me a free 4090 because they love my videos so much. Because of the GPU upgrade, I would be able to make the particle project way cooler, so I put it off and instead wrote a script on why game development is hard to shed light on some things that people may not have thought about before. August marked the beginning of event season for me, so I traveled to Denver for SIGGRAPH and had an amazing time meeting so many of you. It was also my first time being in a new time zone. My whole life has been spent on the west coast. Unfortunately I got COVID though, so the August video was on what I learned at SIGGRAPH while hanging out with the NVIDIA people. In September, I traveled to Seattle for PAX West, helping my friend Phil out with his booth for his game Ollie Frog. I also resumed work on the particles now that my computer had the 4090 installed. A few weeks later, I traveled to San Diego for TwitchCon, where I got to meet so many cool people I've been looking up to for years, who I can't wait to see again next year. The rest of September and October was spent making the particles as cool as could be. I was really inspired and had so many ideas that I spent more time on the project than I usually do. The video turned out really well I think, and it's probably my first video that I'm truly proud of. Obviously with a lot of work comes a bit of burnout, so November was spent on a much simpler video to recover. Aside from graphics programming, this year I began practicing piano because I've always wanted to learn, and I started focusing on my health a bit more by lifting weights, which surprisingly many people have noticed. At the start of the year, I was extremely malnourished and most of my muscles were atrophied. I could barely do a normal unweighted squat, but now I'm benching my body weight and squatting 1.5x my body weight for reps. I definitely encourage everyone to start lifting weights. It's pretty fun. This month, I've been exploring Godot and if it can satisfy my needs for some project ideas that I have. After careful consideration, I've decided that Godot is where I would like to start developing my tools from now on, and I'll be explaining why here shortly. But first, something a little different. This video has been sponsored by Brilliant. 
Brilliant is the best way to learn math, data science, and computer science interactively. With topics covering basic algebra to calculus and beyond, Brilliant offers thousands of lessons for those of all skill levels, whether you're just getting started seriously learning math or are looking to take your knowledge up a level. I personally use Brilliant whenever I need a quick refresher on math concepts I haven't worked with in a while, and I think it's a great starting point for someone looking to improve their math skills for game development on their own time. Since shader programming is essentially just math, a lot of the lessons can be directly applied to shader authoring to create novel effects such as fractal rendering. Be sure to try out everything Brilliant has to offer with a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual plan when you visit brilliant.org forward slash acerola or click the link in the description. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. It's hard to explain why I'm moving to Godot without talking about my planned projects, so let me start by explaining what I've been working on this month. If you've seen my other videos, you're probably familiar with Reshade, which is what I use to apply all my post-processing shaders to video games like FF14 and Elden Ring for demos. For image demos, I use a Unity version of the shader. I blit the image to the viewport, then dispatch the shader, then I screenshot the image. Not very sophisticated. This workflow is pretty weird and not going to work for 99% of people that watch my videos and want to use my shaders on images, so a long requested tool has been an easy way to do what I do for the demos in my videos. This would be a standalone program with a UI that allows users to add, remove, rearrange, and customize any amount of shader effects they want, basically just the functionality of reshade, but in the context of images instead of video games. It might be weird to think of a game engine as a means of building a tool, but there is no real difference between this proposed program and a video game from the end engine's perspective. For instance, Freya Holmer is working on her own modeling software built directly in Unity, which sort of inspired this idea. Currently, I am proficient with Unity and am comfortable developing shaders for specifically the built-in rendering pipeline, which is a problem my work has had for a long time. Unity has multiple rendering pipelines now. With the built-in one slowly fading into obscurity, most newcomers to Unity make use of the universal rendering pipeline, which my shaders are incompatible with. I very much dislike URP and far prefer writing shaders in the built-in environment. It's just easier in like every way. This prevents my work from being more useful than it could be to Unity developers, which is kind of the point. I don't really like when people use my stuff directly. I'd rather you use it as a reference for your own context-specific implementations. But realistically, I know that's not happening. I could solve this by just moving to URP, but again, that would make me want to die. So instead, I turned my eyes to Godot, where a budding community of shader programmers is growing alongside a lack of resources to reference. Godot was behind in the rendering department for quite a while compared to Unreal and Unity, and it still is, but recently added Compute Shader Support and the new Compositor node in Godot 4 is exactly what I needed to seriously consider moving away from Unity. Specifically, it's the Compositor node, which is perfectly fit to the task of implementing my proposed image editor program. But what makes it the right fit? The Godot Compositor is just a collection of compositor effects, which themselves are a very thin abstraction layer exposing the stages of the Godot rendering pipeline to the user. With compositor effects, you can have custom rendering code execute at any stage of the rendering pipeline. I say it's a thin abstraction layer because Godot doesn't give much more than just exposing graphics API functions functions for you to use, meaning you are responsible for compilation of the shader code, construction of the shader pipelines, and shader memory management at the API level, which in Godot's case is Vulkan. This isn't very beginner friendly really, and since the compositor is only recently added, there aren't many resources giving examples for effects at the moment. Despite this, compositor effects are a brand new frontier of graphics opportunities for Godot, and since the effects in the compositor array are executed sequentially, the array is really no different than the reshade GUI. If I were to make a user interface that interacts with the compositor array, allowing you to instantiate new compositor effects, customize them, and rearrange them at runtime, then my proposed image editor program wouldn't be too far off. Even more exciting is that, since it all just runs in Godot, a user could export a shader pipeline they create in my image editor directly to their own Godot projects to use on their own game. I spent the past couple weeks learning Godot and produced this little prototype, so let's go over how it works. 
The pre-alpha version of this image editor features a demo photo, two shader effects, exposure and gamma correction, and the ability to endlessly instantiate and rearrange unique instances of both shader effects by using the UI to interface with the underlying compositor effect array. Shader settings can be collapsed, and right-clicking an effect disables it. Exposure is a scaling of the pixel value, while gamma correction is an exponentiation, so results will be different if gamma correction is applied before or after exposure, showing that the effect rearrangement actually works. I mentioned earlier that we are far more responsible for how these shaders work in Godot than we would be in Unity. For instance, Unity kind of just handles shader compilation and hot reloading on its own, but in Godot, that must be implemented manually. I have here a GLSL Compute Shader text file. We get this file's text as a string and pass the shader code to the Spurve compiler. Spurve is a cross-API intermediate representation of shader code, meaning that it can be used with a number of different graphics APIs. The value here comes from different higher-level shader languages being able to compile to Spurve, such that different shader languages can be used on multiple different APIs. Assuming the Spurve compilation succeeds, we then fully compile the shader machine code from the Spurve instructions and instantiate a compute pipeline with the compiled compute shader code. A pipeline is like a unique instance of the shader with its own memory banks, which we now need to fill with the necessary data that the shader needs. The exposure shader needs the current frame and the exposure value to be applied. Newer graphics APIs like Vulkan and DirectX 12 work with something called command lists, which is a collection of tasks that need to be executed for a GPU workload. Since we're doing compute shader work, we create a compute list, which we then bind our compute pipeline to so the GPU knows what shader to execute. We then bind the necessary shader data, the current frame and exposure value, and also add a dispatch command such that the compute shader actually executes and ends the list. Now that the list is enclosed, it'll automatically be sent off to do its thing and the exposure compute shader is executed. This process is repeated for each compositor effect in the compositor array. For the gamma correction, we use a compilation of the gamma correction shader code for the compute pipeline instance. It's not that bad, all things considered, but in Unity, this would be three lines of code compared to the hundred-ish lines in Godot. Unity just has really simple and easy-to-use shader APIs, which is why I recommend it for beginners. Those abstractions come at a cost, though, and the low-level nature of Godot's compositor effects is incredibly valuable to those with a bit more graphics experience like myself even if it's more work. So that's the prototype. Hopefully the vision is clear, but if it's not, let me show you the way. Exposure and gamma correction are quite underwhelming shader effects, but it's good to start simple. The end goal is a complete translation of my Unity and Reshade shader suites to Godot compositor effects, which currently includes a more complete color correction shader with exposure, brightness, saturation, contrast, color filtering, and white balancing, Photoshop color blending modes of the render on itself, flat colors, or provided textures, a collection of tone mappers to bring HDR values back to the standard range, some blurs, vignetting, film grain, frames, sharpness, the Kuahara filter, the difference of Gaussians, a ditherer, a palette swapper, a generic downscaler to pixelize, the pixel sorter, a color space based corrector using sliders like HSV or OKHSL, OK bloom with an embedded color corrector to adjust the bloom color before composition, auto exposure, the ASCII shader, FXAA, chromatic aberration, a CRT filter, a color blindness simulator, chroma keying, and some 3D post-processing effects like screen space fog, depth of field, edge detection by depth or normals, and screen space ambient occlusion. This list was a lot longer than I thought it would be. All of these effects are written and designed to be endlessly combined and rearranged to create new unique post-processing pipelines, which I've been doing in Final Fantasy XIV for my fancy screenshots. Shader features aside, obviously I would like for you to be able to put in your own images to apply shaders to instead of just the seal, with proper export settings for max quality renders and resolution settings. Since I also want this to be usable by Godot developers for their own games, example 3D scenes will be available to test shaders on, and hopefully the exporting of compositor effects from the program to your own projects will be pretty simple. I'd also like to clearly communicate the performance implications of the current list of compositor effects, with the ability to specify a budget that the program will prevent you from crossing 
crossing. Well, that's about the vision for the image editor. If you have any ideas yourself, be sure to let me know. At some point, the code will be fully open source for anyone to learn from for free, but not right now, as I'm still learning how things should work myself. While I'm really excited to start writing shaders for Godot, my videos will remain engine agnostic as always, so anyone can learn from them, not just Godot developers. If you'd like to support my work, feel free to check out the channel Patreon. As always, a huge thank you to all my current patrons. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to go see Nosferatu five days in a row. Anyways, that's all from me. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.